Don't be surprised at some point you know, if gold goes to five thousand dollars an ounce or more, which I expect. Don't be surprised if it's not the government doing it rather than the market because the government can be so desperate to get inflation that they'll actually devalue the dollar against gold, which means a much higher price for gold. Hello, our guest today is Jim Rickards. Uh, Jim, I want to thank you uh, a lot for appearing in our Hidden Secrets of Money video first before we get started. You're actually in four of the uh, episodes that are out. And so we've, we've featured you, and I, I just want to thank you for uh, being in it and all of the tweets that you've done on it. Um, you have a resume that is astounding. Uh, you're a portfolio managed field management uh, for the West Shore Group, partner at Tangent Capital. You've held senior positions at uh, Citibank. Uh, you were involved in the 1981 Iran hostage crisis. Uh, you were general counsel for long-term capital management, principal ne negotiator for their bailout in 1998 by the uh, Federal Reserve. People do not know how close we came to the entire world monetary system freezing up. And you were one of the people that sort of saved the day when it came, came to keeping the wheels turning. Uh, uh, you're an advisor to the U.S. intelligence community and the Department of Defense, and you're the author of the bestseller Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis, and uh, now you're coming out with a book called The Death of Money, The Coming Collapse of the International Monetary System. I have a theory. You are actually triplets masquerading as a single individual. Nobody could accomplish this much in their life. Uh, first, how did you do it? And then let's talk about the book. I mean, this, you, you were just talking, saying that uh, you're managing a mutual fund and a hedge fund right now. In a way, my career has mirrored the evolution of the monetary system. I started as a commercial banker in the 80s. I then switched to investment banking, worked for a primary dealer. Uh, for the viewers who don't know what a primary dealer is, Mike, you know, when, when the Federal Reserve prints money, uh, they do it by buying bonds from the banks. You illustrated that very well uh, in your videos. Well, you have to, the Fed won't do that with any bank. You have to be on an approved list. There are only about 20 banks on the list. Um, these are the so-called primary dealers. And I was chief credit officer and general counsel of a primary dealer. Had many, many meetings at the Fed. Uh, you know, when people look at the Fed response to crises, Michael, they say a couple things. Number one, they never saw it coming. Then when they realize the crisis has started, they underestimate the magnitude of it. And then when they figure out the magnitude, they underestimate the duration of it. And then when they figure out the duration, they apply the wrong remedy. And so you say to yourself, well, how could they always be wrong? They're not stupid. They have 160, 170 IQs. They're a lot smarter than I am. So how could they always be wrong in policy? And the answer is, they're using the wrong models. If you have the wrong model, it doesn't matter how smart you are, you're going to get the wrong answer every time. It's as if, you know, I'm holding up this pen, and my model says, you know, if I let go of the pen, it's going to float up to the roof. That's my model. Well, guess what? The pen drops to the table. So you have to have the right model, and, and the Fed doesn't, and that's part of the problem. Tell me the difference between Keynesian, or not the difference, but tell me about Keynesian economics and monetary illusion. Well, you know, a so-called money illusion, I, I write about this in the book, and you know, John Maynard Keynes talked about it as well. Uh, money illusion is the early stage of money printing before the inflation becomes apparent. So it has a kind of feel-good aspect to it. And, uh, you know, we all, uh, none of us condone drug use, but if you think of what a drug user would say, they say, well, you know, it feels good at first, then you get addicted, then you end up in the gutter, then you end up dead of an overdose. Uh, but inflation is sort of the same. It's, when it starts out, it feels good, but then the, then the inflation takes off, it gets out of control, and wealth is destroyed. So it always ends badly. But right now, we're in the money illusion phase. We're in the kind of feel-good phase. You know, stocks are going up, housing is going up. Well, when the Fed prints money, it has to go somewhere. It really is not showing up in consumer prices yet. It is, it is showing up in asset prices, so those are just bubbles. But there's a great example of this, and I write about it in my book, and... Uh, uh, chapter 7, and it's the inflation of the 60s and 70s. You know, the, the money printing and the monetary ease really started around 1966-67 to pay for the war in Vietnam. But the public was not alarmed by inflation until 1973. It took six years of monetary ease, and again, it kind of felt good before that suddenly it looked like inflation was out of control. 
the inflation really spun out of control in the late 70s, from 1977 to 1981, Inflation was 50%, 5-0. The dollar lost half of its purchasing power in a very brief five-year period. Then when Volcker came in and raised rates and Reagan came in and created a more favorable business environment by cutting taxes, cutting regulation, saying to the world, hey, the United States, we're not going to destroy your wealth. We're going to create wealth. The U.S. became a magnet for savings around the world because we went to, you know, we paid savers a high interest rate and we had low taxes for entrepreneurs. That was a great combination. But inflation didn't get back under control until 1986. So you had a 20-year period. In 1966, it was about 1.7%. And in 1986, it was about the same, about 1.6%. So you had a 20-year round trip, but it went up to 13% in the meantime, and then back down to 1.6%. So that shows you how long these things can take to play out. But money illusion is the early phase when it feels good, but it's heading to something bad. But the, but the problem is, the problem I have is that the smart money can take advantage of it. So the leverage guys, the hedge fund guys, the private equity guys, uh, these are the people who get the, the benefits of money illusion. The everyday citizens, they're the losers. They're the ones stuck on the back end paying inflated values for things and high prices for things and watching their purchasing power erode. People frequently say, that the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power since the creation of the Fed in 1913. Well, that's a true statement, that the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power. But then the, the Keynesian economists say, yeah, but who cares? Because, you know, salaries went up and dividends went up and stocks went up. So maybe the dollar's worth less, but all this other stuff is worth more. And on average, everything's fine. Well, on average, things may be fine, but people are on average. You have winners and losers. This leads to income inequality. This leads to social unrest. So the average may work out okay, but the rich are getting richer. Everyday citizens are getting left behind. And my only point is everyday citizens don't have to get left behind. And they can have some gold. That will preserve their purchasing power. That will help them preserve wealth just like the big guys do. Uh, my last question. Uh, you know, when countries get into uh, uh, deep into debt and when they have uh, – trade deficits, uh, the solution has always been to devalue their currency. Uh, and they do that by devaluing against the dollar, which is the majority of the world's currency. If you want to devalue the dollar, how do you do it? Well, you, in a currency war, and that was the subject of my last book, Currency Wars, uh, the U.S. tries to devalue against other currencies. But as you said, well, the, yeah, they're trying to devalue against the dollar. And that's a zero-sum game. Two currencies cannot both devalue against each other at the same time. That's a mathematical impossibility. So, so far in the currency wars, the U.S. has been trying to dollar, uh, devalue. And what we're saying to the Chinese and the, the Brazilians and the BRICS, say, hey, you guys have to suck it up and deal. You have to let your currencies get stronger. But, of course, they don't want their currencies to get stronger because it hurts their exports and hurts their jobs, etc. So, so this is what the currency wars are all about. Now, this was happening in the 1920s and the 1930s. When countries get desperate and you're the dollar and you can't devalue because everyone's devaluing against you, there's always one thing that you can devalue against, which is gold. Because gold can't fight back. Another currency can fight back by printing more, but you can't print gold. Uh, you can't pull gold out of the thin air. And so gold just sits there and takes it. And so when countries get desperate, when they're, try when they're, when they're worried about deflation, and if you listen to the central bankers, listen to the IMF, they're more worried about deflation than inflation right now. When the central bankers are worried about deflation and they're trying to get inflation and it's not working, the one thing you can always do is devalue your currency against gold by raising the dollar price of gold. So don't be surprised at some point, you know, if gold goes to $5,000 an ounce or more, which I expect, don't be surprised if it's not the government doing it rather than the market because the government can be so desperate to get inflation that they'll actually devalue the dollar against gold, which means a much higher price for gold. Uh, that's the type of scenario where we could wake up one morning and it's already been done. Thank you very much, Jim. Look forward to our next interview and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. I think that what's going to happen is that we're going to have uh, Ben burn the currency, Bernanke is our next Fed head. We're going to have the housing bubble pop. 
There will be a contraction in the M3 money supply because uh, um, of all the wave, the tsunami of bankruptcies that's coming. I think uh, your episode four is very beneficial, very helpful. It's going to introduce these ideas uh, to a lot of people. And like I've just been talking about, we have to change people's mind. And the more they understand it, the better. So I think uh, an explanation and diagrams to show it is very helpful because, quite frankly, they're not going to get it in their grade school. They're not going to get it in their high schools. They're not going to get it in college unless they're in a very rare circumstance to understand how, uh, how this works.